Sorry. Well, that's this one group yeah. of pictures. The other is actually just single frames. Right. But the uh, interlaced. We're, we're lunging straight into it. Let's I've go. Got, I've got a first question. The question is, could you tell me your name and tell me what your principal role is? Uh, my name is Steve Gladstone, and my principal role is cinematographer. And I'm moving into director, cameraman. Oh, okay. How long have you been a cinematographer? Um, I've been shooting, I don't even know, um, I've been shooting about 10 years. Like I did, I was a camera assistant and I started to shoot and then I worked for about a year and a half on the Steven Spielberg project, which was documenting, uh, documenting Holocaust survivors' testimonies oh, for yeah. the Shoah project. And that was incredibly intense and incredibly amazing. And then at the end of it, I just kind of went mad for about six months because it was so depressing and I was begging them I was like please just give me foreign language interviews and I because I just the horrific stories and and the tremendously amazing stories too uh, what people went through I I could not survive you know I've met some I met amazing people um, and it was just amazing it was amazing it was yeah all just amazing. it's just stunning yeah I mean I think I actually met a capo you know, there was one guy and he was talking about his story and his friend came and his friend refused to be on camera because you allow your friends or family to be on camera at the very end. And the person we were interviewing said it was the best day of my life was when we were liberated because I got to save my friend's life. And, you know, the, it's really intense. And then there So you've got a strong documentary background. I have. I have a... That was that's kind of weird because you were basically you were sitting. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to give just a simple frame and not move in, and not change the frame. Not do emotional don't, stuff. Right, because it's supposed to be. It was supposed to be more or less chapters in a book, oh. and although everybody's story was interesting, you're not. It's not their story. It was the compilation. It was supposed to be oh. the. And what the was measure. that? One? What was the format of that? That was shot on Beta SP. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was shot on Beta SP. So I did that, and I started shooting. I was doing. I'm doing short films. So there's a lot of short films. Uh, that's really seems to where I've ended up becoming my niche. Oh. And I taught for about four years, right after, right around the 9/11 situation. I started uh -huh. teaching, and now I'm back to freelancing and uh -huh. being it, being a dad. <laughs> <laughs> and but a mix of a mix of formats all the way to film as well. Yeah. Right. Well, I started really shooting mostly film. Like I studied that in college, and I got an act and I was working on films and I got, first I got an Eclair ACL and then I sold that and then I bought an Aton and I just loved it because it was dead quiet. And it's so funny, it's like, you know, why do you, why'd you buy this camera? Because I can be really close to the actress or the actor and you can't hear the camera and you can really get that shot. So, you know, the image, your image creation tool is, is, is governed by the quality of the sound, you know, the fact that it's quiet and it's a, I love that at times. It was a beautiful piece of equipment. I finally just donated it to a school, though. And I picked up lenses along the way. And then uh, last year or so, I did a, a lens test. I was like, I want to shoot film, and I want to see how my lenses translates to HD. And I borrowed a bunch of people's lenses, and we did this, this huge thing for a day, shooting resolution charts with every lens, and then also shooting an actress. Cause in yeah. the end, who cares about resolution? It's, yeah. it's how does somebody look? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the funniest thing is, and, you know, I get knocked on it, but this actress looks so pretty on this old ingenue 12 to 120 that doesn't cover Super 16, that doesn't, you know, doesn't have the technical specs, but she just really made her look good. And some of the better technical lenses, just they didn't, they really didn't look nice. Right, right. So. That's interesting. So you, you, you see, I had a question. I'll ask this question anyways, mm -hmm. be, because it's along the route. It, 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 how hard is it to pass bit into the cinematographer role in this country? Um, you know, it's easy. You just buy yourself a camera and go sell yourself as a cinematographer. It doesn't mean you're any good. And um, I think we get that now with a lot of the cameras. Uh, a lot of people like you know want to compete with me. They just buy a camera, and now I'm a DP, but you don't know anything about lighting. You, you, you don't know how to light. And, you know, I was a camera assistant, so, but I studied lighting, and I went to museums, and I worked on shoots, and I watched how people light, and I did a lot of testing and a lot of practicing, and I shot a lot of film. And I think, you know, my favorite film stock is gone, and it was Kodachrome, and I shot, I shot this piece on Kodachrome, and it was really just a test. 
It was just a 10 minute film with different light setups, a very simple story, just to see what it would work at. And the skin tones were beautiful, amazing, stuff that you know I haven't seen since. And Kodak's killed Kodachrome because there just wasn't a market for it anymore. It makes sense they're a business. But to get in, the, you know, you can call yourself a cinematographer and you can shoot and you can go sell yourself for nothing with your camera, which I can't do and I'm not gonna do. You know, and you can just say that and then and, and people will buy you. They'll go go for you because you have equipment and now they don't have to pay a rental. They don't have to take out a insurance and basically they're using you for your equipment. Or you can, you know, probably the, the best route is along the lines of being a gaffer. Mm. You know, and if you if you gaff, you start working with all the lights, and then you know the lights and you're working with the DP and you're working with a lot of different DPs. I've had, a, you know, people come gaff for me, people come work with me because they want as much experience with different people who do different things. They see how they re react and do something. And for years I didn't use Kinos and then there was one job, it was a Kino, and I was like, ah, that's what I've been looking for. That's exactly the look I've been seeing and wanting to get and it's, it's the Kino. Great, so now that's in my bag of tricks. And it's a really nice look. It's like the shadowless, wow, it's just lit. And it's fabulous, but it's not always the right look for everything. Yeah. So well, I got a bunch of I got a bunch of questions flying around in my head here. Just, you want yeah, me to move or no, no, can on. just my neck can talk and no, <laughs> you're using this to do all the things you didn't want your interviews ever to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> just like don't move. Don't, just, don't look So at the bag of tricks tricks thing is kind of an interesting thing because yeah. I mean, I, I've just been writing an article for some magazine or other in the UK, which is about the invention of lights, because uh, I, I found out that uh, Jordan Cronenworth, during, during the making of Blade Runner, made a thing called the Crony Cone, uh -huh. which was basically just a big softbox on the front of a 10K. But right. like, we all have to have our little tricks to, to get by and to also our, our, our kind of value-added point. But I'm kind of taking this slow run up to HD here. Because I'm wondering about HD as the in the bag of tricks. Like, well, well like you were just saying, I mean, the, one of the things that's hanging around this conversation, even though we haven't said it yet, and, and will be said a few more times, is the red thing. Because it's a moment in time where anybody can kind of get hold of this camera, which is actually quite complicated, and say they're a cinematographer. I mean, what do you feel about this kind of thing? You know, I actually think it's going to be the Scarlet. The, the 3K camera, like I've sworn I will never buy another camera because it just changes. But now, they're, Red's coming out with this camera next year for $3,000, that's 3K resolution, fixed lens. I think that one's gonna be the new DV. Like right. all the DV cameras and even the HDV cameras and even some HD cameras like the, the Sony EX1, they're all like, they have the lens mounted. That changes your workflow. You know, all of a sudden, you know, it used to be if you wanted to shoot, if you were shooting on video, you know, you had a camera and you had a backpack and thank God I missed those days. You know, if you're shooting on film, you know, you have the camera and you have lenses and they're interchangeable and they're these heavy duty mounts and you need someone to pull focus. And so you start having your crew sizes made for you, what you need to pull it off. Now it's these handy cams and you know, the operator suddenly has to now pull their own focus, which okay, sometimes it works and in documentaries it works, but in, in narrative stories, it's not always the best situation. So I don't, I don't know if that's addressing to the, yeah. the HD bag of tricks. It's like, I know when I shoot, there's like, I know when I'm, I'm up against it. Because all of a sudden, I'll, I'll suddenly go, I've done this shot a million times before. And I just like, naturally, that's my inclination when I'm, I'm out of time and I need to get it like that, 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 that one you pull out of your, your pocket. That setup that, you're, that you can always do, no problem. That's, in, that's your bag of, that's, it's almost your signature sort of setup. Yeah. That's where you end up pulling out of it and it's, to me it's like well cool it's great I know it delivers value but it's a compromise and it's it means that I'm I'm behind and I'm I don't know that I'm actually using the shot because it's the right shot or the lights set, that right set up or it's just that we have to make the day so I'm always when I catch that happening to myself I'm always like well, okay that's it, am I doing the right thing you know it, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel for every shot yeah. and it doesn't make sense to but, you know, when you're suddenly back in your comfort zone, it's usually it's like you're pressed for time and, and you're, you know, how do we do this? And instead of, you know, I just, I just shot a short film and we were pressed for time and, and I said, well, let's do it. And I 
threw out what I had planned and I went with something which worked wonderfully, so much better, simpler, and I loved it. I was really happy. I was directing this and I had actually, for the first time, I was using an operator. I was like, I'm gonna now direct, I'm gonna have an operator, but I was still dealing with the lighting. Um, and it's really difficult. It's because you've got to deal with your actors and you've got to deal with the lighting and it just, each one takes away from the other. What was your format of choice on that? On this one, it was actually, cause the budget, I went to DV. Because I, I have this little DV camera and it's, it's for NTSC. I mean, potentially it's for, really for the web. So, you know, I didn't want to spend a lot of money on the format, on the stock, on renting a camera. Instead, I ended up spending it on a makeup person because it was a, it was a horror film with a zombie. It's actually a little, a little zombie kid. Like a girl has to babysit a zombie. That's the premise of, of the short. And so I was like, well, we need, I can't do the zombie makeup. So I ended up having to pay a makeup person and paying the crew because just, you know what, I just don't want to, I've done the freebies and I just not asking yeah. people to do freebies anymore. So you were talking about you did, did short, you were doing short films at the moment. Do you, do right. you use short films as an experimental place? Um, in terms of like trying new I things? Did, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's, you know, that's where you kind of get to do them. Uh -huh. You get to play around a lot more because you oh, know you're demanding feel... HD because there's a buzz. A buzz I'm sorry. For it. Are they demanding HD? Yeah. Uh, you know the the last film I shot for I shot a film for somebody and I've shot it on 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 film and I've shot it on DV, but I have some projects coming up with a friend of mine who are actually buying an HD camera. He's like, I'm buying the HD camera. I don't want to ever rent again. I just want to own the camera. And that's his. That's actually his thing. He had, he had a film camera and I was like, you know. Don't buy the camera, rent it. You know, I have a film camera, whatever, but he's like, I want to own the camera. I want to have the camera. And everybody's different. You know, some people are like, okay, I want to own the equipment. And then I have full control over it. And I'm like, yeah, but now you're trapped. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't own the equipment, then you can just rent the next is that, is thing. Is that why HD so dangerous at the moment though? Because it's changing so damn fast. You get trapped into it, but where, where's it end up? I mean, in the end, wh where's the image going to end up? If it's going to end up on YouTube, shoot with pixel vision. I mean, you know, it's such horrible compression. What's the, you know, what's the point of shooting at a high data rate and, and huge files and it's compressed? I, I just cut something for somebody and the person's like, it's five minutes long. And so I rendered it out uncompressed and it's a gig. And they're like, no, 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 I need it like 25 megabytes. So I have to compress it. Six, 16 times or something to get to get it so that so that they can have it emailed to them. I'm like, well, I'll put it on an FTP site. I'll mail you the disc. No, no, no. Email it to me. It's like, uh, I mean, HD, I think HD is like this. I think it's almost done. I think HD really? really, I think, I think HD is pretty much, it's like, I think tape is going away. Tape is now going to be archive. It's like tape will be archive and, and probably LTO tape because it's much more stable than the helical scan. But I think, you know, I think HD is going away. I think there's DV and there'll be HDV and there'll be a lot of these HD camcorders. But five years from now, people are not gonna be stuck shooting. HD will be like sneered upon. It'll be like, you know, super eight, but not artistic. It'll be like, that's the cheap fabric. I mean, cause all the, you know, the cameras are gonna be higher resolution still. You know, we're, we've moved beyond HD. So HD was just a partial moment it's on this going just like all the other formats effectively. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, somebody will be like, well, I really like HD. And I don't know that you need more than HD, truthfully. You know, even for shooting, if you want to project it, unless you're doing IMAX or, or, or super big projection, but projecting the theater, I don't think you're going to need more what than you, what HD. What do you think the public's getting though? Because we, we're, we're, here we are with all these formats, but I mean, we haven't really got HD. We got Sky in the UK, which is mm -hmm. HD. And the B, we've done some tests, but you've got channels and channels. Yeah, we don't have HD though. No, all right. Tell me about. So we don't. We, we don't have HD. I, I, I can't. The, the, the artifacting that goes on and, and that I see. It's you know, I was watching when I first got digital cable, and I was just watching people's eyes. They're 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 not moving. Their eyes are bouncing up and down and up and down because of all the compression that's going on and and. We don't have HD by the time it, it's through the pipeline. You know, sure, it's supposed to be HD. Well, what's HD? Well, it's HD, I think, Simti says HD is anything above 480. Like 480p and above, that's HD. So 720p, 
you know, 1080p. 1080i is just is just 540, you know, interlace. So how much resolution is there? What is it? So, okay, anything of 480p and above. So 540i, that counts as HD, which is really 1080i. It's 540 interlaced, you know, 1080 interlaced. So you're seeing a 540 frame and then the 60th of a second or 59 9 of a second later, you get another frame. That's 540. But then it gets compressed down and mushed down and crushed down and, and sent over cable with 100 other channels and, you know, your box is recording it and how much compression is happening there and is it MPEG compression? Is it wavelet compression? That was like this great idea for a while, the QViz. It was like, I saw that, I was like, that's brilliant. And I don't even know if they're doing it anymore. It's like, you know, all these compression schemes. And you always need a new codec if you want to play on your computer. You always need a new this, new that. And is it? I don't know. You know, is it like, you know, what are you doing? You're taking a gallon of milk and you're, 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 you're crushing it down to the size of a quart. And then you're pulling out the milk container. But now you only have a quart of milk in there. So let's just add water to, to make it. And it looks sort of like milk, and, and if you never actually tasted milk, you wouldn't know that it wasn't milk. And it's like, okay, well, that's okay, that's fine. You know? Well, what do you see in, in that case? Um, what do you see, if, we, if we're basically skipping HD, then we're all into raw, some form of raw, yeah? Yeah. So is, is that where you're looking to? I mean, I'm kind of interested in you as a cinematographer, what, what do you want? What do you want out of all this? <laughs> technology I want like simplicity like S Sony I think Sony who I've kind of been a Sony basher I don't I don't know if you want to talk about companies I but I, I've been I've been kind of like a Sony basher on stuff because I think they just have a tendency not to listen and then I saw the f23 and now they have the f35 yeah. I haven't seen it, but the f23 and oh my god it's actually it looks like a movie camera and it's operated the same way but they have this brilliant idea where you can actually lock things out so you, there are things that you just don't play with anymore because, you know, I, I start working on, on video and it's like, okay, detail up to three, four, five, minus, plus, chroma. You know, in a sense, a sense I feel like this. My $300 light meter is replaced by a $60,000 monitor. That, and when I'm shooting, I'm looking at a monitor to tell me what's going on. And I know that when I'm not, when I'm shooting and I have a, crappy black and white video tap and I'm shooting film, I'm much more into creating the image rather than looking for what the image is on the monitor. You know, and it's, it's a great tool. It's a really, the monitor is like such a seductive tool and it's hard to resist. And it's, it's a nice thing to be able to actually look at the image that you've created and see that it's working in the final way it's going to be displayed. But there's no way we ever actually know what it's going to be finally displayed at anyway. I find that you can get sucked into the monitor telling you what to do and not being a tool but being the arbiter of it. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of problematical for me. And, you know, when you have video, or a, I want to say video, when you have like electronic capture as opposed to, to like film, you know, film, you open the can, the film, you put it in the can, you shoot it, you bring the lab, you're processed. And if you're doing a traditional film finish, you can affect the brightness and you can affect color, and that's it. You can't affect contrast. You can't, you know, you can't crush the blacks, you can't pop the whites, so to speak. You can't, all these things that you can do in an electronic environment, you're really hard pressed to do in just a straight film only environment. So in one sense, that's really nice. That's really liberating, that you can actually have to rely on making that image the way you want it, because you're not gonna be able to play with it later. On the other hand, if you don't have time, if you don't have the crew, if you don't have the budget to do what you want on set, you ha it's nice to have all those tools. But then again, now you start to lead to, like philosophically, do I water down the image? Do I really go for it? Or do I make sure that I'm covered in post so I don't have to, oh man, you killed it. You know, I shot one job for somebody on film and I, and I couldn't get to the telecine transfer. And I lost them as a client. You know, I shot for them a few times because we decided, we talked about it, and I said, here's what I want to do. I'm not going to be at the transfer. I'm going to shoot a very specific way, the exact way we want it to look. But it's going to look weird. And it's going to be, it was underexposed, three stops, and it was orangey, and it was, and it was beautiful. It's exactly what we've talked about. 
And I could just hear in my head the colorist going, this guy messed up, man, this is so underexposed. I can't save it. And the director not remembering, this is exactly what we talked yeah. about doing. And we went for it this way specifically so we'd be locked into this look and, and couldn't, couldn't change it. So now I've been taught my lesson. You can't lock yourself into a look. Because is that these... because you can't... Now, for me, here's, a, here's an issue around here. This thing about believing it's all post. Now, you're the eyes and mind that are gathering, and selecting and making choices. And then we're supposed to pass it over to somebody who doesn't know what it's like to be in minus 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's got the comfortable coffee going and a few balls and can sit there and prognosticate on what we've done. How do you feel about that? I feel when you're, they're your ally, you know, and if you can be there and talking with them, I feel they're, they're like every other member of the team. If they're a good team member and if they're interested in, in, in getting the image right and not pushing, well, I'm the star, you know, then they're an incredible asset. And colorists can really, can really bring out the best in your images. But if, if it's about making themselves look good, then you have a disaster. And, but unfortunately, you know, it also depends on the project. If you're doing a personal project, you're doing, if you're doing something with somebody's self-financed project, then you have a tremendous amount of control. But if you're doing a commercial, or if you're doing you know, a feature film, you lose that control and you, you know, the DP is now one member of a, of a much greater team and has no real power or authority. You know, you can say, it has to be the way I want, but in the end, the guy who's paying the bills is gonna have it the way they want. And that's, that's the end of it. So, you don't want your situation to affect you. You know, you don't want the fact that it, the sun's coming up in three minutes, so I can't light it the way I want to affect you, although it happens. But, you know, I don't want that person who doesn't know what I want going for the image. I want them to look at the image and, and get what I'm after. And if they have another idea, that's fine, but there has to be a discussion about that. So that we have a meeting of a mind, so we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you give your labor for free at the grade? Yeah. I do, yeah, I have to be there. I haven't been paid for it yet. You know, and I've, I've actually, on some projects, I've been like, give me the tapes and I will color correct it on my system yeah. because you've thrown it into your edit system and it's compressed and it looks terrible. And now you're compressing that and you're turning it into a DVD and it's just horrific. And it's like, you know what? I, I'm, I have a system I can put it in uncompressed and I can do the color correction and I can be happy with it as opposed to I have no control over what well, you're what's doing. What's your attitude to the traditional notion though that, I mean it seems to me that in the old days, which are very recent, <laughs> that uh, the, the cinematographer was a kind of quality control person from the, from the inception to the end. We would, we would make sure no screw ups occurred and it seems to me these days what do you feel about the possibility that these days there's so many more mess ups are in the mix because of this pushing it all back to post? I mean, what do you feel about it? Uh, it's an accurate statement. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. It's true. I mean, there was a, there used to be broadcast standards in America. There used to be, now anything can get on. Basically, really anything can get on. They don't, there's no need for, there's no concern about quality. Um, DPs used to be hired, but even that was before my time where you had a DP and like, this is how it's gotta be shot. And, and while that's really important in the past, film stocks got, got much better and with much more latitude. Experimentation started, what people accepted as images were and became acceptable images changed. So that sort of went away. I mean, it used to be you bought film and you bought film from Kodak and there was a little pamphlet that said, do not exceed this lighting ratio of three to one, which is like the key twice as bright as the fill, unless you want unusual effects. It was like, <laughs> because Kodak didn't want people coming, go, your film's bad. I took pictures and look how horrible it is. So the, that was included in all the film you bought, little pamphlet like that. Now it's, it's just, anything goes, it seems, in terms of, you know, if you're looking at a commercial project, that's different. But if you're looking at, at personal projects, anything goes. And in many cases, it's like the more extreme and whacked out, the better. But what I find is a lot of people going back to like, okay, I bought a camera, I'm a cinematographer. What I find is, 
or, or I'm the director and I'm going to shoot this and I'm going to be the producer, the director, the, the cinematographer, the sound recorder. It, well, I find a lot of that stuff is just the most boring, unthought out, ugliest looking stuff that's mediocre in all levels. You know, it's a battle. It's, it's a fight against time. To, to, you know, when you're shooting, you, time is the most, it, it, the most essential element. It's the most expensive thing you have. Even if you're not paying people, time just goes. And one minute wasted here is a minute lost somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, they think, I just get the camera, the camera's now making the image. And that may actually now become true when you start talking about ultra high resolution cameras with tremendous video cam or electronic cameras with tremendous uh, amounts of bit depth. So they can just capture a wide range of images, and now, now you really can go around and make a mess of it in post, and you can try to find things in post. But a lot of people, they just mind the cameras, and they think the camera makes the image, and it doesn't. You have to have thoughts about it. It's not even, you know, you can have a ton of lighting gear, but if you don't have crew, what's the point? You can have crew, if you don't have lighting gear, again, you know, what's the point? You know, if you have one light, you don't need 20 people to work it. So a lot of people don't know how to work the gear that they have, and they almost don't seem to care. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it's okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm just all of, it's, it's it's kind of a difficult area, but it's becoming an extreme, extremely difficult area. In that the prob, if the problem is, is that HD was a passing flavour. Because for I just remember getting my first colour single tube uh, camera way back. Well, not get, I didn't buy it, but we right. got access to it. And then we got the first three tube, and then we got the first three chip, and then we, and so on and so forth. And the wait for high definition was so damn long. Then it came, and then it went. It really has, it's really, it is. It's like, it's almost done. <laughs> it, it really do. That's true. I'm just going to take your iris down a bit, not your iris. All right. I'm going to take the iris down a bit there, because it's got a bit brighter. I'm kidding. And that's me. I'm glowing internally from <laughs> <You> the... <were>. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is, because now it's, it's you know, what's, it's all 8-bit recording, and, and the camera's doing more, but it's your recording format, and it's... It's now data, data management. You know, it's not even tape flow. I remember. I don't detect any, any anxiety. I've interviewed a few people that I detect a great deal of anxiety about what's coming. You don't seem to have any anxiety about it at all. Because uh, I'm just about to jump into it. Right. You know, I'm just like about to, and I'm like, okay, it's fine. You know what? I've, I've dealt with, I've moved through my, okay, well, film, film, nothing will ever supplant film. And now it's sort of like, Film is fabulous, it's wonderful, and there's a certain discipline working with it. But it's undeniable that, you know, HD has established a presence, and now we're moving beyond, and unfortunately, it's now a matter of budget. You know, I love to shoot film. I love the smell of it. When I get it back from the lab, I, I just open the bag and I smell it. But you need, you know, with a film camera, you need so much crew and infrastructure, and if you don't have that commitment to it, and a lot of people I work with, you know, don't have the commitment to it. The last thing I shot in film, we shot in black and white. And it was gorgeous and it's beautiful. And it was a full on production. And since then I haven't had that many crew to work with. I mean, I had a full grip and crew. I'm in the low end of stuff. And so it's like, you know, where can you get people? I But isn't the high risk stuff gonna demand exactly the same kind of crews that's film? It ought to, and it should. And I think a lot of people are like not are, are realizing that like when they get their they get their red camera and they buy their lens sets and all of a sudden they can't shoot the way they're used to shooting because they're used to shooting with a camcorder and oh wait now it's different now it's it's harder so in a way it's going to bring back a certain manner of working but just looking at like images like we're on the red you know where man we shoot it and then I can change the ASA in post and it's a different image but it's the same it's the same quote unquote negative sort of thing. There's certain certain amount of discipline is gonna be lost. People are not gonna care about. Huh. That's interesting, because I'd I'd gone the completely other way. When when I started I was standing in Yosemite and I was looking at the view and I was thinking about this camera that I had and I was thinking, where do I place myself on the curve? And it was a moment of not anxiety, but a moment of um, it took me back into film. It took me way back into film, right? I was, oh, right. I've got a 
polarizing filter. I've got a couple of stops of ND. Uh, I've got a third of a, a half a stop up the, up the top on the clouds, very gently there. You know, all this stuff. Were you spot metering? I, w I wasn't because I had my old, I had my old, you know, I was just measuring in the shadow. I was at 16 and in the sunlight I was at 45. So I was like, okay, I've got to place myself somewhere there. And then I've got all this end. What do we do? I'm exposing, exposing for highlights, printing, printing for shadows. Or is it exposed for shadows, printing for highlights? I was trying to be, I was trying to be like all over it. <laughs> I was trying to be in the right, I was trying to be s not safe. I don't believe in safety, but I was trying to, I was trying to be in a place all I can say is it took me back to the film space. So my question for you in this is, because you've just painted the other picture, with, which is that there's such kind of latitude that they spin the dial, who cares? I think, I think there's going to be that latitude. I think on a lot of cameras there isn't. You know, I'm shooting this thing and it's on DV and, and you know, we irised open, check focus. And I was like, man, I would just love to shoot this. I would just love wide open, look at those highlights, just blowing out and I mm. wish that I was able to shoot that but I'm not because they're blowing out ugly yeah but you know so I so on like DV format talk to me about HD. blowing out ugly talk oh god ugly. like Film. video when it blows out ugly you get this yellow thing that's this it's dead it's lost you can't ever do anything with it you can't bring it down it's always yellow it's it's hard I shot this beautiful thing on Kodachrome we transferred it to to to, to video and it was just like some of the areas, okay, I messed up, and you know, I was learning Kodachrome, and it, it was too thin, so you were blowing out, so it's just yellow, and there's like, there's no detail, there's nothing you can do, it's just sick, it's sick, it's terrible. But, you know, and film has that, that ability to, to hold the highlights, and your blood, it's not ugly, and then when you transfer it to some other format, it's sort of like you've got that, You've got that on film, so you've got room to move. Like if it's negative, you know, if like you really want to live in the danger zone, you shoot reversal. Like yeah. that was always the phrase, like, yeah. you know, reversal separates the men from the boys. And, and I shot this thing on Kodachrome, it completely kicked my butt. It just was like, it's 40 ASA, I'm, I'm not used to that. How do I, you know, how do I deal with that? And, you know, but it is glorious. It's beautiful. It's, it's the skin tones are just amazing I've never seen before or you know or since you know until you go back to technical and then you start looking at these beautiful skin tones so that's gone but then if you start shooting you're transferring to video and it's got such such a limited dynamic range standard video even HD has an 8-bit range the same as your standard video range so once you clip once you're blown out you're doomed you know there's nothing to retrieve and it's ugly. It's not a soft roll off. It's not a. It's not anything that, that's usable. And from what I understand is, you know, you have engineers who design the equipment, and they have one way of thinking. And then you've got users, uh, people who are like, look, I'm not. I don't care about the technical specs. I want it to look a certain way. And there's a big fight going on. Not so much a fight, but like there's just this wall. Nobody can get past it. And finally, it seems like. The, the camera manufacturers and the camera designers are, are actually like piercing that wall so that we can now say, look, this is what I want. I don't care technically whether it's right or wrong. This is the way I want it to work. And I want to be able to have this range. And I want to, if I have a clipped highlight, I don't want the clip ugly. I want it to have a nice soft look to it. And so it's years and the fight's been on by many people. You know, and every time you talk to a camera manufacturer and go, that's not right. And they go, but it's right. Technically, it's correct. Technically, it's correct. And it's like, no, listen to me. I don't care. I don't care technically it's correct. I care that it looks the way I want it to look. I care that I'm able to make the images that I want to make. I don't care technically correct. I'll, you know, I'll shoot with, like, you know, pixel vision. I'll throw mud on the lens if I, if I won't throw mud on the lens. But <laughs> I will do, you know, what I want is, is, you know, what I want is what I want, not what I'm forced to have. So it seems like now we're, adding, we're entering a stage where the camera manufacturers are all going, okay, I have really got to listen to these people because they're using my equipment. And, you know, I get a camera and I'll work with somebody and I'll, I'll purposely muck it up. I will, you know, I have my default settings, but I love if I'm working with a camera I've never worked with before. I love to get a test and we'll go shoot some stuff and we'll, we'll, we'll make the highlights of an odd color. Because really, who wants to shoot the same bunch stuff? I know very few people. That, you've said something here that, I, that very few people have said to me, and in thinking I've been doing about all of this too, is that there was a moment when film 
got very clean and lenses got very clean. So everything was great, but we had to dirty it all up to get some atmosphere going. Now the problem is, with this stuff, with this stuff, we've got this clinically clean medium, and if you do go into dirtying it up, you usually muck it up. So, I mean, what's your attitude to generating looks and developing yeah. looks? You know, I shot something on TV, and, and, and a friend of mine who's like in the business, he's a, he works for a film company or a production company, he was like, I still don't believe that that's like video. And I'm like, yeah, but it's because, I smoked up the whole room, and I really controlled it, and I underexposed it. So it, it, so it technically it's wrong. Technically it's wrong, and it's not right. But it looks right, and it, you know, everybody who watches is just like, I can't believe that that's 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 video. And I'm like, well, if you really look at it, you can see where like certain things are blown up, and and they're not right. But that's the idea. I don't care perfectly clean. It's sterile. It's dead. Did you retain the insulated structure, or did you? No, that was 24p. That was okay. 24p. Okay. We should, that's a big thing too. I mean, for me, it's like the motion. It, it makes a big difference, and part of it, I part of it is really, you know, what we've grown up and gotten used to. But a lot of it, I think, really goes to like the actual like people like 24p or England's 25. How come how come 24 film looks so different than 25? Well, but 25 on English TV, if I know, is, is not really 25. It's 50. Yeah. And what's happening is you're refreshing at like 50. And in America, you're refreshing at almost 60, 60 times a second. Yeah. And what part of what I really believe is like if you go back to the theater, you know, the theater is a social experience. Yeah. And it used to be like 16 frames a second. And then they cranked it up to 18. And then eventually they standardized to 24. And it was motorized so nobody could keep changing it. And I've heard like, you know, the, the, the exhibitionists would keep increasing the speed of the projector so they can get an extra showing in. Finally, they said, stop, do 24. And apparently that was a, a decent speed for magnetic striping of the film. Before that, it, was, it didn't matter because it was all a record. So you had the film running at one speed, you had a record, and as long as they started and stopped at the same time, you were cool. Um, but you end up in this, in the theaters, this social environment. And we don't have that at home. But you have 24 frames per second. And what happens is the image is projected, and the projector blade is either double or triple. Uh, bladed, so it, it cuts off. So the idea originally was, the more often there's a flicker, the less likely you are to notice it. Remember, movies call it the flicks. So that's great. That was a mechanical way and a very, very pragmatic way of of reducing the flicker without increasing the rate of film. Film's expensive, even in the early 1900s. Yeah, there was a kind of argument about whether it's two slits or three slits in the in the wheel. So that you can... right, and there are two apparently, and there are three, and. But what happens is while that is being broken up, like in the theater, while that's being broken up and while you're, you're, in, you're actually in complete darkness and you don't even know it because it's happening so fast, that's where the magic happens. It's between the frames, it's in the darkness because you're sitting surrounded by strangers. So you have this, one, you have this sense of anonymity because nobody knows who you are. You know, because if we're outside and somebody, we see somebody poked in the eyes, we don't laugh. But if you see it in a movie theater, you do. You know, the Three Stooges, some people do, apparently not everybody, and that, that's fine. But that's the concept. You're, you're anonymous. Nobody knows who you are. So one, you're, you're able to let down your guard a little. Two, you're surrounded by strangers. So there's a little bit of fear there that creeps in because you don't know who, the guy next to you, you don't know the other people, until their cell phone goes on or they just don't shut up. It completely ruins the magic of the theater. But then there's that element of being in the dark. And you don't even realize it, but your mind is catching on that there's image darkness, image darkness. And in that darkness, your mind is able to process the image. And it's almost in a dream. Like when you're dreaming, your mind is just set free in those moments of blackness. And so all those things you remember from your childhood come up. And somebody standing there looks like, looks like somebody else. And it, it, it can totally you know, work on a psychological level. Yeah. So you've got a social and psychological level going on in the movie theater. And as far as like motion at 24, as opposed to 30, from what I've heard, it's like one or eye is supposed to see it around 16 frames a second. I don't know. But, you know, again, when you're getting 50 or 60 flashes of images to your, to your brain, it's really approaching the level of your, of your limit of what your brain can process. So there's no time for that, for that dreamy state to emerge. And you're sitting and you're, you're watching it on TV and it's brightly lit and you know, your room is lit, you're talking with your friends, you're not even paying attention to the media anymore. So 
there's a less impact there if you're watching something like that. When you're in a movie theater, it's this this citadel, this temple of watching the image and getting immersed in it. Is there any difference in that space? Do you think of film projection and video projection? I think yeah, I think I think because video projection, from what I understand, you know, the screen is never completely dark. You know, DLP, it's like you know the micro mirror moves like ten percent or something. So it, it's amazing that you get the image, you can get the depth you can with it, but the image is never dark. So I, I think you know there's a difference. It doesn't feel the same, and you don't get that emotional impact by watching a video, an electronic projection, as opposed to a film projection. Well, this is, for me, there's a crossover here, and I kind of want to explore it for you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Which is this issue of the clinically clean medium methods of projection. Uh, the, the deal is, the popcorn is an enhancer of the suspension of disbelief. Right? Now, film, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, if you can sit in a fish and just stuff your face and right. the dark, then you're going, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready. Right, I'm oh, ready. I got you, I got now, you. Then it must be something, the film, the photochemical medium and the electronic medium, there's still this kind of problematic area, it seems to me, where, uh, now I've got to phrase, I've got to put this into a question. I mean, about showing, you know, di digital projections of films that require that you suspend your disbelief and go into that world. And the problem of, sorry, this is a big round question, this one, um, where in the past you get the film was too clean and the lenses were too clean, so people had to heat the developer up a bit or whatever the hell, bypass the bleach or whatever. We found ways to do stuff that, that enabled the popcorn to work better, <laughs> if you see what I mean. <laughs> so in the mix, We've got a problem, haven't we? We've got this electronic medium, super clean. So far, we're just, a lot of us, a lot of us, a lot of them, as far as I'm concerned, are leaving it to post mm -hmm. to the guys that aren't out there in the minus 10 degrees temperature. But the, our problem is we've got to deliver atmosphere. How do we deliver, how, how are we supposed to deliver atmosphere if we can't get at the, the, the materiality of the medium? I can't even make the question work. You know what I mean? Do you, do you understand what, what I'm getting at? The, 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 the kind of digital realm is almost too damn clean. Right. So what are we to do, do you think? You know, we're, I think I know because you're like, you're pushed to a nice film, you can touch it. You can, you can, you can step on it. You can, anything you want, you know, to it. You can, it's a physical medium. Digital, it's not. It's, it's not even ones and zeros. It's, it's on-off states. It's electronic pulses. And while that offers you a lot of wonderful advantages, yeah, there's a lack of materialism to it. There's a lack of, 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 of reality. There's a lack of limit, in a way. But you're the, you're the guy that's employed to deliver the thing that this material is lacking in. But almost, you know, sometimes it's, it's really frustrating because you could shoot a really beautiful piece, and by beautiful, I mean it's appropriate, and it could be gritty and grimy, it can be dirty, and then it can even be, you know, the colorist. They could do a beautiful job, and it's just right. And by the time it gets to whomever's going to watch it, Someone's compressed it, and now you've lost all that fine detail. You've lost that, that smoky feeling of atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. You've lost that, and, and it doesn't care, because reality, what's happened is, is programming, film, content, it's all now a commodity. Yeah. That's what it is. It's not, it's, not even, it's not even a matter of art, art versus commerce. It's just, it's a commodity. It's meant to be consumed. So you can, you can put in as much effort as you want, and, and you have to. You can't ever just sell out and say, well, I don't care. This is, this is for a cell phone or this, I don't care. It's not an option for us, is it? It's not, and, you know, and, and, but it's actually one of the battles you have to fight. You know, you have to, it's, hi, I'm shooting and it's 40 degrees and, you know, and, and the production has messed up and, and I have these head, headaches, and, but I have to keep finding that shot. I have to keep moving the camera to position, you know, so if I'm just in a situation where I'm just framing composition, I still have to be working with moving the camera and, co and composing the shot to make it work, to work with what the actors are doing. But in the end, you know, this is being sold to people as, like, you know, as a commodity. It used to be you go to a movie theater, I didn't understand this for the longest time, you go to the movie theater and people would dress up. I was in Chicago once. I'm from New York, and I was in Chicago, and, and they had one, they had like one or two showings a day, and they were all at night, and people showed up dressed up, and I'm like, no, movies, you just go to watch movies, you know? But now I'm going, well, it's something about taking the time to watch a film, to go and set aside your time, 
turn off your cell phone, set aside your time, go, and I say that because my cell phone's going off right now, but you know, set aside the time and, and dedicate yourself to watching and enjoying the film and, and, and it becomes an event. Now it's, I watch it, it's on demand, I can stop it, I can fast forward, I can stop paying attention to it. It's become such a commodity. And even the people who shoot for the highest quality, in the end it's like, I need to make, make it for, it needs to be sold to the lowest common denominator. It needs to be sold to the largest possible audience, as opposed to all that craft and all that work being targeted. And you know what, if, 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 Joe Blow doesn't like the movie, that's okay. If Joe Blow doesn't get the image, and it's unfortunate because now we're at a stage where we could really make images easier in a way. You can make them easier. They're more accessible. You know, I love film. It's really expensive. It, it can be really expensive to shoot. So, you know, if you get one of these digital cameras and you can spend as much time as you want mucking around with the image to get exactly what you want, that would be wonderful. Wouldn't it be great if we could educate people to watch films and watch images and look at it and really appreciate it. If I go to a museum, I want to walk up to that painting. I'll go to the Picasso Museum. I was in the Picasso Museum in Spain. I got my nose like two inches away from the, from, from the actual painting and nobody said a word. And I'm squatting, I was like, I want a ladder. I want to climb up, up. And I want to look down on the painting. I want to see how this, this eight foot wide painting changes when I'm looking at it from a different angle. You know, I really want to eat, you know, it's like I have this phrase, eating, eating the, the artwork. I really want to, really want to just take my time and eat it. It's not like that. It's, 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 you know, great. We have now more tools. We can, we can make better images cheaper, but we're not really making better images, you know, because we're not putting the time into them. All this technology, it's a great boon if you know what you're doing. But I don't know that people have it. Uh, there's an analogy. I used to do archery. And I was talking to some people and they, they have all the sights and the string silencers and everything and all that. And I said, well, does that make you better? And he goes, it doesn't make me better, but it makes somebody who's not as good as me almost as good. So I have to use the same technology so that I can stay ahead of them. And it, it's sort of like, you know, the guy, so all this stuff that helps you, that, that it's great, you have all this wonderful control and latitude, but do you know what to do with it? You know, it's like, I taught, and you know, one of the great, the great experiments, the great thing to give a student is, you have three minutes. To, you have three minutes of image, tell a story. That's it. Go to, don't rewind the camera. You can't rewind the camera. Go tell us, just so they start going, wow, I made a mistake and I'm stuck. I can't rewind the camera. And I would do that with my students and, and half of them would come back and, and they'd be like, they, they'd admit to rewinding the camera and cheating. And I'm like, but the point is, Tell the story. I'm not grading you on this, but tell the story with three minutes. Don't make mistake. You know, make mistake. You make a mistake. Whatever. But without that constraint, without that constraint in it, you lose a lot of the discipline. You lose a lot of, in the end, what you're going to be able to to do with the medium. You can't stretch it. You know, if you stretch it willy nilly, you don't know what you're doing. You're not going to get consistent results, and you're not going to be able to pull them out of your bag of tricks. And even though you've got this great latitude and this, this great ease of working with stuff that's immediate. I mean, that's really in the end the beauty of, of digital or of electronic is that it's, you can see today, you can see this second what you're doing and do I like it or not, as opposed to actually having to done a lot of experimentation, tried and true and know what the result is beforehand. You're gonna, you can see what you're, oh, do I like it or not like it? and then move on. So you, you can make a lot more changes and, and in a way you can make a lot more experiments or mistakes in, a, in the same amount of time. But if you don't have the practice and if you don't have the understanding on it, it's just, it's just goes in the garbage. You don't learn from it. What's come up, and, and this question arises again about dosing up the image. Now, now you, you, if you tell us that little tale about the, the DV and adding gain and stuff like that, but can you also, I need to bring us, back into HD or at least high res or something and the clinically clean image and tell us, you know, finish us off on that. But so, to tell us about the Oh, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's like I've shot stuff, I'll, I'll smoke up the room because it, it adds something to it and not for the shafts of light, but it just adds that, that, that this very organic diffusion to it. And the, the, the light scatters slightly different and it's beautiful. But I'll often just throw the gain up on DV and amazingly how much nicer it looks. 
because DV is this compressed thing. It's very compressed, and when you're compressed, you lose all your fine detail. So you, you muck up the image, you, you whatever it is, you add the gain. People refer to it as adding a dithering effect. So your pixels aren't, aren't exactly so sharp and hard edged and in a solid fixed array you've got some, some randomness pattern, this noise going on which, which helps make the, make the image more soothing. Going on to like the ultra high res, um, I don't know how to get there with that, you know, in terms of, of it's so clean if your image is boring. We were looking at that Yellowstone, that footage, and there was nothing boring in the frame there. And as you pull it out, it's just beautiful. It's small detail, but it's fine detail. And the res is enough that when you have that ultra high res, you're able to get that small detail. So your eye isn't missing it. But I think still with HD, you know, when we get to ultra high res, then you'll be able to see such fine little details. And that's why close-ups work really well. Because if you've got a clean, even if you have a clean image, a person's face, unless they've got tons of makeup, is really interesting. If it's lit, if it's lit, lit poorly, if it's lit well, and there's something interesting to watch and there's texture, you're not going to get tired. You're not going to see a boring expanse. Do you stay away from hard lighting with HD? Um, I found that I've moved away from hard lighting, actually, in, in general. I love hard light. But time constraints, you know, and, and the way people want things to look now, you know, I think, in a way, some of that has to do with, like, 3D gaming where like everything's lit, you know, and the people are now getting used to it. I mean, the 3D gamers are really the ones, in a way, who are driving the way images are. This is interesting. I have actually interviewed four Sony games designers who are very, very anxious and stressed because HD means to them a hell of a lot more work. And the games play goes down. The higher the res, the yeah, lower the... The frame rate, right. Well, the lower the pleasure. Oh, really? Right, the, the higher the res. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, as far as HD and lighting, you know, I think one we've developed sort of a sense of it. It's like when, when, you know, if you looked at, I had the pleasure of seeing the the circular TV, the first one, the, the I forget what it's called, like the first television with the rotating disc, oh. and you know, to actually see somebody's face, they had to use like black makeup on one side so you oh, get detail. Talking, you're talking about Logie Bear. Right, Logie Bear. Stucky, yeah. There was a ventriloquist dummy called Stucky Bill, but they right. used a spinning disc, right? Right, right. Okay. This was pre Farnsworth, right? Yeah, this was yeah, the yeah. spinning disc television. Yeah. So you really need, even in theater, you have to exaggerate the face so that you can see detail. As you get more and more, as you get more and more resolution and more and more ability to display that resolution, you don't have to be so heavy handed. So hard light tends to recede because now the shadows, which once looked really nice, which once were good because you had a lot less resolution, so you needed that huge contrast. You don't necessarily need as much contrast now because you have more resolution, you have more ability to display the resolution. And you've got color, which just changes everything. You know, I mean, black and white is so beautiful. And in a way, I think black and white is even more honest than color because you can really get at something and you're not, the color's not getting in the way. The color can just, you know, deceive you. And it's a great tool, but, you know, the best images, the most stunning images are like black and white. They're stark, they're contrasty, they're gorgeous. I mean, do you think we'd be better off in some HD stuff knocking out the color altogether, given it's so, so not very good? <laughs> <sighs> I think, I, you know, I think it's interesting, but unfortunately I don't think there's, there's a big market for it. Yeah. You know, and if it's not shot well, it's just boring. Who cares? Has HD hit New York in a way where everybody's having to shoot on it, or are people? No, I don't think I don't think it's not hit New York yet like that crazy. It's coming, it's there. Even though we're phasing through it, you know, I think, you know, look at the red camera, and then there's the 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 SI camera, the SI two K, and then and I'm, probably there'll be more. And then like if red comes out with their Scarlet next year, these sixty five hundred dollar cameras will just disappear from the market, or they're gonna go down. Really, you know what's going to happen is the big guys will be shooting HD, and all the independent guys are going to be running around with something higher, higher resolution. You know, and and but I don't know if they'll know what to do with all that resolution. You know, that's the that's the other thing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My pleasure.